so we are starting a new series called PS. Uh, this simple abbreviation starts for postscript, right? Postscript. It comes from the Latin word uh, postscriptum, which literally means written after. Have you ever, I mean, in today's society, right, we, we text usually, or even an email, right, we push send. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh man, I forgot to add this. I forgot to add that. I forgot to, you know, tell them this. And then we're either sending another email or we're sending another text or we're calling them up and saying, hey, I forgot to add this. Um, it's one more thing. Everybody say one more thing. One more thing. The postscript is an additional thought or it, that is added to a letter. Sometimes it's even added to other documents that come after it's been completed. You write the main body. I remember when uh, my grandmother used to send me cards from Tennessee and, and letters. She would write, you know, the, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know, and then she would always write P.S. P.S. I love you, I miss you, whatever it is. Um, today in our digital society, uh, handwritten letters have become more and more rare in the world. We just don't do it as often as we used to a couple generations ago. But uh, those letters, when you do receive them, don't you feel good when you get a handwritten letter? Even a handwritten note, yeah. it is personal. It is something that someone, they get excited about. Even when someone writes in a card, they just don't sign the card. They actually write, you know, on that blank page, right? When they write that, it makes you feel good. Even when you are writing that, um, it is a personal letter. It's a personal words from your heart. P.S. at the bottom of the page means so much more. With Valentine's Day just around the corner, P.S. I love you is going to be real popular, right? P.S. I love you. This is going on in my life. P.S. I miss you. P.S. I wish we could get together. Whatever it is. You know, all that mushy gushy stuff for Valentine's Day. But it's not just the personal ones. Um, that really get to you. Sometimes they can be even a little uh, misleading. Like the grandmother that wrote her too busy granddaughter, adult granddaughter, that ended her letter with this. P.S. Thank you for reading this letter. Letter. Uh, maybe a little sarcasm, right? If someone is too busy, you're like, are they even going to read it? Are they even going to care? But we got to think about maybe the six-year-old little girl named Emily who wrote Santa with all the things on her wish list and ended with, P.S. Santa, I don't think you're fat. Oh. And how tall are the average elves? Right? Hey, you don't know what's going to come out of a little kid's mouth. Or the letter from the supervisor that he received from an employer expressing how much he loved the job, how much he enjoyed the job, his coworkers and customers that he used to or would meet daily. But at the end of this heartfelt letter, he wrote, P.S. I quit. I won the lottery last night. Oh my God. You never, never know. Or the last example is eight-year-old Raul, who wrote his grandmother, a letter about the family picture that his mother was sending him. P.S. I'm only smiling in the picture, so you will think I'm having fun. But I am not. Mom made me do it. Oh, no. Right? How many of you had tried to do your family pictures and the kids are like not wanting to take a picture? And you're doing everything possible, right? Apparently Raul was this little kid. All month long, we were going to focus on one man that wrote a lot of PS's in his books. Paul, he wrote love letters to the church. For the month of Valentine's Day, you know we talk about love. Well, Paul was passionate. You gotta be passionate if you're writing a love letter, right? It's just not something you just, oh, it really doesn't mean anything. No, Paul was passionate about the letters to the church. He wrote 13 books of the New Testament, and it was to reach 
the church. It was to encourage the church. How many of you like to get letters that are encouraging, right? Paul was that guy. He wrote those letters, and he ended most of them, not all. He wrote or ended most of them with a PS. But to help us understand the PS, we have to look at the content of the letter with Paul. So if you would, turn with me to the book of Philippians. So a little history on this letter that he wrote to the church. It's very clear that he is the author of, because he identifies himself. Right? I'm Paul. I am Paul. Candidates for this place where he wrote this letter include Rome, Ephesus, Corinth, or Caesarea. But it is clear that Paul was imprisoned at the time, and he was actually imprisoned not in a prison cell like we would think, right? Because we found Paul in the middle of a prison cell before. But this is a little different. Paul is actually in the Roman general's tent with guards. Not the worst condition, but he is not free to go. Paul is being persecuted for preaching the gospel, sharing the good news. However, he's not free to just walk out. He is under guard. But he is still able to reach a church. Paul wrote in his letters to the believers of Philippi. This city was located in a gateway between Europe and Asia. And it was kind of like a mini Rome. It was a smaller city, but it was influenced highly by Rome. A large number of the uh, population was Roman citizens. It was a wealthy city because it had gold and silver mines that were close by. Today, the ruins are found in modern day Greece. The Philippians, uh, they were proud of their Roman heritage. They dressed like Romans, they often spoke Latin. Many of the Philippians were retired military men who were given land in the vicinity, who had served a term, and were given this land to be a military presence. So basically, they retired from the military, and the Roman government said, hey, we're going to give you some land if you go occupy this area, but you're not going to be officially retired because we need you as a military presence. <laughs> right? You know people that have retired but not retired? Well, that was these men. Paul is not addressing an uh, overriding concern in his letter. See, some of his letters start out where he's got an issue. He needs to correct. Paul isn't, in this letter, he's not correcting the church. Paul is pouring out his heart to the church. Paul is, for the most part, simply a pastoral communication between Paul and the church that is especially dear to him. He's reaching these loved ones, and he's saying, hey, I love you guys. I haven't seen you in a while, and I want to encourage you. In this letter, he identifies three themes, joy, humility, and thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but I like those, right? Again, it wasn't correction. It was just out of his heart. He was facing persecution, imprisoned, and he could face death at any time. He didn't know what the future hold. But how would you like for someone to write you a letter encouraging you speaking about joy and humility and, and thanksgiving. And he was in a, a desperate place. It encourages me to realize that, you know what, sometimes even when I'm in a bad spot, I can still encourage other people. Paul was that guy. I think we can learn a lot from Paul's letters. When we read this, we realize that he wasn't just directing this to a small group of people in a city. He was addressing us today in the church. He is addressing us, saying, hey, I want to encourage you. There should be joy in your life. You should have humility. And there is a time of thanksgiving. So today's uh, message, I want to title, Surrounded by Caesar's Household. 
Now I know exactly that's not really a chipper title because again, he is in prison, but he is mentioning joy and humility and thanksgiving. So I think we gotta have to dissect that a little bit before we get to the PS at the end of his letter. I believe it'll make sense when it comes from his heart. He addresses that Timothy is with him and he directs the greetings to all the saints, to the overseers and the deacons of the church. So we're going to pick up in Philippians uh, chapter 1 and we're going to read 3 uh, through 11. It says, I thank God, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because in the partnership of the gospel from the first day till now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether, uh, for whether I am in chains or defending uh, or confirming the gospel, all of you share God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this is my prayer that you love, that your love may be abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to, uh, to the glory and praise God. He is saying, hey, I want to let you guys know that no matter what situation I'm in, even though I'm in prison, even though I can be free or I'm in chains, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about the church. I'm thinking about how much I love you guys and how much I want to see God prosper in your life. That's a message for us today. That we are encouraged thanking God for the people that is in his life. He is praying with joy, praying with joy that he will, he's preaching not only to himself. Sometimes you got to encourage yourself, right? Mm -hmm. He is in a situation where even though he's not, he's got circumstances, he's not looking at his circumstances. Sometimes we got to look at what we're going through in our life, but we got to say, you know what? I could be worse off. You could be looking at your situation in life and saying, you know what? It could be worse. I'm going through this. I got this doctor's report, but it could be worse. He is in a situation, but he's thinking of others. He says, whether I'm free or in shackles, I have you in my heart. We oftentimes look at the mess we're in and we want to have a pity party, right? We're all that way. We've all done that. Like, woe is me. I'm just, you know, poor me. I'm going through this. And Paul is not looking at his mess, but the message to other believers that he is carrying. He's excited about what is going on in the church. He's excited about God's guidance in their life, seeking wisdom and clarity that they will live for Jesus Christ, that they won't fall into the world. So they won't get pulled back into the mess that they were in. He's saying, keep pushing, keep going. Paul was such an encourager. You ever just been around those people? You just go into work and they just encourage? Or you're just happy all the time. You're like, man, I want some of that. Whatever they're, whatever they're drinking, whatever they're, whatever, how did they wake up that happy? Paul was that. That guy, even though he was persecuted most of his ministry, he goes on with this chapter, um, one of giving instructions. He's like, I want to, I want to share the gospel boldly, and I want you to share it too, with confidence, with the right motive. You know, Paul wasn't 
He didn't have a chip on his shoulder. He didn't, when he wrote his letters, he wasn't like, look at me, look at me. He always pointed everyone back to Christ. Every time when he would write, he was always like, it's not me, it's Christ. It's not me, it's Christ. It's not my power, it's Christ. It's not my boldness, it's Christ's boldness. He's saying, I can do it all through Christ. We see here in verse 27, it says, Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He's saying, no matter what's going on, whatever you face, make sure that you uphold yourself, that you conduct yourself like Christ would. Because if you don't, what does that do? That diminishes your story. If you go around and tell people, well, I go to church, but then you cut people off in traffic, or let's be honest, some people give them the bird, right? If you do that, or you act a certain way at work, what does that tell people about your story? It dulls your light. It dulls your story. They don't, when you talk about church, they're like, mm hmm that hypocrite. Right? It does. You hear that word hypocrite a lot because you act one way, you say one thing, but then you act a different way. You should be the same, what? In church and out of church. At home and in work, you should be the same. He says, don't compromise. No matter what you're going through, don't compromise. In chapter 2, he gives us insight to imitate Christ with humility. Again, Paul wasn't always pointing everybody to him. He always pointed everyone to Christ. He says, it means that you walk around telling people, you can't walk around telling people that you're humble, right? You're, oh, I'm very humble. I'm very humble. No, you're not. If you're talking about you being humble, you're not humble. Okay? He's saying, act like Christ. Paul says, don't imitate me, but Jesus. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make me joy, uh, then make me joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain consent. He says, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you, uh, e each of you look not only in the, your own interest, but in the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. He's saying, hey, don't... Don't do it for personal gain. Don't do it for a wrong motive. When you are sharing your story to people about Jesus, don't do it because you want to gain something out of it. Do it because you're pointing them to Jesus. Paul's like, don't, don't do it out of selfish ambition. Paul says this isn't a one-man show. Even though he had started many churches, he's saying, hey, I need you to make sure that you're like-minded. We are all like-minded. We are pointing everyone to Jesus. He points that, that the church, the behavior of the church, should be what Jesus taught, not what man teaches. You know, man can interfere in church, right? We can do that. Man can interfere with church really quick. If you take Jesus out of church, all you have is a club. If you take Jesus out of anything you're doing in your life, well, then you're just living for the world. And he's saying, don't do that. He said you need to be boastful about the gospel, but not arrogant. Arrogance will turn people off really quick, right? He's saying... Don't walk around with a chip on your shoulder. He said, I didn't do it. 
Jesus didn't do it. Because Paul did. When he was Saul, before he had his transformation, before he had his, his blindness on the road to Damascus, he did have a chip on his shoulder. He was, what, a couple weeks ago I talked about the murderous threats. He was going to throw anyone that was of the way, right, of the church in jail. But, and he had a chip on his shoulder then, but after he had that encounter with Jesus, after he was blinded, after he was anointed, and, they, and God says, I'm changing your name to Paul. Humility came about. Most of the time, though, we see Jesus spoke in third person. He didn't go around just saying, I'm the son of God, look at me. Right? He always was in care of everyone else. And Paul seen that. Paul got that experience. The disciples were the same way. They seen how Jesus walked and talked, and they moved on with the church. Paul didn't have a problem reminding the church to stay focused on the many letters that he wrote. He says it in this statement in chapter 3. It says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things again to you. Repeat. You think as humans, we forget a lot of things, right? We read something, we watch something, we have an experience, and then we forget. <coughs> you ever do something where you need a reminder over and over and over again, right? Reminds me now, I was in elementary school and you, I goofed up a lot, okay? I wasn't a model student. Believe that, I know, it's hard to believe, okay? <laughs> Um, and you have to write on the chalkboard or on paper, I will not talk in class. I will not run in the hallway. I will not chew gum. Any of you ever done that? Don't look at me like I'm a bad person. I'm not the only one that goofed up in elementary school. Come on. Okay. Um, but, because I did a lot of that. But, again, it's about repeats. God says in his word, multiple times, he repeats things. That's why the Old Testament and New Testament merge together. They're married together. Why? Because we also have God saying, you know what? You didn't learn it back then, but I'm going to repeat it again. You need to know. You need to know. So he would repeat. Jesus was good about repeating things because... People don't listen. They only get a little bit. You know, they say that you can, you only retain about 10% of your learning. About 10% of your learning. So all that stuff you learn in school, okay? And so then you watch people on Jeopardy, and you're like, how in the world do they, how do they know that, right? It's aggravating. If I get one or two questions right, I'm like, whoo, I'm a genius. But, okay, but God repeats, repeats. And I think that's just telling us, hey, we need to pay attention. Paul reminds us to press on. Say that with me, press on. Press on. Press on. Chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Not that I have already obtained all this or, having, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of what, of which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to be taken hold of, or hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining forward to what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He's reminding the church, don't act like you've already arrived. Don't act like just because you walk in the doors of the church or just because you, you wear that bracelet that says you're a Christian or you go to a church or you wear that shirt, you know, all those logo, church shirt logos, you know. Why are you calling me out? <laughs> <laughs> But when you <laughs> but when you do that, right, he's saying, 
And not just, don't act like you've arrived just because you have that. I'm not picking on her. I see that each time. I'm like, wait, wait. If you're, if you're guilty. No. Oh, Lord help me. But what it is, is he's saying, don't act like you have, you have it all together. Because we don't, right? We're humans. We're messed up. We're messed up. That's why we have a message. And he's reminding you, out of your flesh, your sinful nature, don't act like you have arrived. You need Christ. You need him in your life. Paul reminds us to press on. Press on. He's saying, we have all fallen short. He's saying, don't, don't skip forward. Don't dance forward. He's saying, no, strain. You're going to be strained. It's going to be an effort. Straining means effort. It's not going to be easy. Paul didn't say, well, everything's going to be great. Straining means that there's an effort. There's energy. Nothing is going to be just handed to you in life. And just like that guy that says, I quit, I won the lottery last night. Okay, well, guess what? Just because you have money doesn't mean you all your problems go away. Just because you have money doesn't mean that you have arrived. People strive for position and money, and then they get it, and then they're miserable. They're like, well, I've achieved this, but now I still feel empty. Because the money's not going to fill it. That's not going to fill your void. Position is not going to fill your void. He's saying, heaven and eternity with Jesus is my prize. He says, here on earth, I have work to do. And many times, it's going to involve blood, sweat, and tears. We're going to shed some tears. Paul shed some tears. It's going to take effort. You're going to strain forward. Remember that. It's not going to be easy. But it's going to be easier with him than without him. It's going to be easier to push forward with Jesus and know that he's got your back than try to do it on your own. Because I'll admit, if you try to do it on your own, you're going to fail. If you try to do it on your own, it's going to take longer. It's going to be harder. And you're not going to be able to push through. And of course, we couldn't get out of Philippians with one of the most famous verses of that book. Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Or I can do all things through Christ, right? I can do all things through him. Again, not ourselves, but through him. Paul says, don't limit yourself through your strength. He says, I'm, you got to think about, I'm sitting here in jail or confinement. He's saying, make sure that you're pushing through. And let's let, wrap up this letter. Um, this is a sh very short letter. He says um, in verse or chapter 4, verse 19, he says, And my God will meet all your needs. All your needs. I like that verse, right? How many of you like that verse? God will meet all your needs. Whatever your need is. Health, money, provision, whatever it is. Emotional, God will meet all your needs. And we stop right there. We stop right there. We like that verse. But then we fail to read the rest of it. And God will meet all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. We forget the second half, right? Because if we only read the first half, then it's he'll meet all my needs. Or my wants. There's a big difference between a want and need. It separates that wants from needs. God always doesn't give us what we want, but he gives us what we need. A lot of times we are just so focused on our wants. It's like a Christmas list. Oh, I want this. I want that. I want this. Right? But what do you really need? You get some people like, oh, I need. And I'm not picking on women, okay? 
Um, but some people, some women are like, oh, I need a new pair of shoes. Okay? I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, okay? I need a new pair of shoes. However, probably the husbands are thinking, no, you had no room in the closet for another pair of shoes, okay? But. She needs to pay your closet. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look at that. trying to help you out, Andrea. <laughs> Anyways. Oh, Lord. Somebody needs a new fishing rod. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no. Okay, all right, focus, people, focus. Paul is giving us our wants and our needs, okay? But again, it definitely separates the wants and the needs. We all have those, right? I mean, even when we go to, when we think about, okay, well, I'm going to the grocery store, what am I going to get? What do I want and what do I really need? You know, do I really need this, or do I just want it? But Paul wraps up, and he closes in verse 20. He says, uh, To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen, right? He stops. That's it. Everything's good. That's the way he ends it. Everything's good, right? He wrote his letter, and he, he finishes it with, To God and and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. But we wouldn't have a title series, a PS, if we stopped there. Because he has an afterthought, right? The afterthought was our title. In chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me Sing greetings. All the saints sing you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. Amen. So, at first when I read this, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Caesar's household? He had that big of an influence on Caesar's household? But remember, he wasn't in the palace. He was in the guard's tent. He was in the general's tent. So he was outside of the city. He was, he was confined, but he did have an influence. So who was around him? Caesar's household. If you actually look into it, it was the slaves. They were not blood relatives. They were not in any way blood relatives to the emperor. They were either slaves or freedmen that were actually working around the palace, or in this instance, uh, other duties in a servant capacity. Which means that during this time of Paul's confinement, he was sharing the gospel with the men and women that were around him. He was sharing the gospel with them. It'd be great to say, yes, I shared the gospel with Caesar's household. Right? But he did. He said, I shared the gospel with those around me, mm -hmm. with the slaves, with the people that probably would never, ever hear the gospel unless I was confined in shackles in this tent, not free to go, and here I am preaching the gospel to them. He's saying, and I think this is a lesson for all of us, no matter where you are, take every opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, I'm in prison. I'm stuck here. I'm not free to go, but I'm sharing the gospel. I'm at my job that I really don't like, but I'm sharing the gospel. I got some friends or neighbors that, mm, you know, they kind of get under my skin sometimes. What should I be doing? Sharing the gospel. Paul has given us an example to share the gospel. No matter what we're going through, no matter where we're at, we should be sharing the gospel. He did it with passion, and we should be doing it too. Paul was giving us the example that Jesus taught him. Do it with passion. Do it with love. Even when Paul's letters were correcting the church, he did it in love. He wasn't doing it to be, you know, malice towards them. He was doing it because he loved them. And he wanted to see them do better. 
He wanted to see them get through whatever was going on. He wanted correction. He loved the church so much that he encouraged. He loved the church so much that he would repeat instructions. And he would again show them examples of what he was going through and how to act. He was doing everything because he said, I can do everything through Christ who strengthens me. He's saying, whatever you're going through, give the message out. Don't look at yourself, but look at the needs of others. That's a message for all of us that we need to take every day. It's just not on Sundays. It's what happens on Mondays. If you would stand with me. Paul was essentially saying, P.S., look around you and press on. Take every God-given opportunity, every God-given opportunity that you have, and share your life and the gospel with others. He's saying, don't waste an opportunity. Because you might not get another one. But if you can share, man, the impact that it could have on someone's life, life changing, right? Eternal. And maybe you're here today, or maybe you're watching online, and you say, you know what, I don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, but I really want one. There's no magic trick. All you have to do is say this very simple prayer from your heart. So if everyone would close your eyes and bow your heads, if everyone would repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe that your one and only Son Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. But on the third day, he rose from that grave and is alive today. Lord, I ask you into my heart. I ask you into my life. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 You know, as we go throughout the week, I just want to pray over all of us. That we go into our situations in our life like Paul. That we don't miss the opportunities. Because if a man in prison can preach to the slaves, what can you and I do? If a man that was confined and was not free to go, can change the household of Caesar. What more could we do? God's given us opportunities. He will give you opportunity. If you ever ask God, please give me an opportunity to share the gospel, you better be ready. Because he will. He'll put that cashier in your line that just needs encouragement. Or the waitress or whoever it is that you come in contact with. If you pray that, be ready. Because God will use you. And don't think that it was, well, I'm not an apostle. Remember, he was, he was given a message to the church. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep spreading the gospel. And you'll make a great impact. Look for the needs of others. That's why we're doing Love the Black Hills, because we're reaching the needs of others more than ourselves. Heavenly Father, as we go into this week, Lord, we ask that you give us opportunities to share the gospel with others. Lord, our family, our co-workers, our neighbors, Lord, whoever we may come in contact with, Lord, that you would lead us and guide us and you would speak through us. To advance the kingdom all for your son's glory in christ's name we pray and everyone said amen and amen we are excited to announce that the month of february is love the black hills 
Throughout this month, we will partner with other nonprofit organizations and people in the Black Hills area to be a blessing. For more information on how you can get involved, visit our Welcome Center either before or after service. Women of Freedom, mark your calendar for a Women's Day Out on Saturday, February 26th. We'll meet at Colonial House at 10 a.m. for breakfast and then head on over to Pottery to Paint for a little fun. Make sure you RSVP on our website and invite a friend. Did someone say ice fishing? Men, I want you to join me on Saturday, March 5th at 8 a.m. We're going to be in Sturgis at Bear Butte Lake. I want you to RSVP on our website and invite a friend.